All right. Hello again, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for this week's session of the Parks Weekly Webinar Series. My name is Amy Price, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator here at Parks College. I will be joined today virtually by Dr. Zustiak and current students Joey and Ether, who will be showing us around the Biomedical Engineering Program's Soft Tissue Engineering Lab. We're very excited to have you joining us from wherever you might be. Thank you for taking the time to virtually visit and learn more about the aviation and engineering programs at St. Louis University. In total, Parks College has programs available in aerospace, biomedical, civil, computer, electrical, and mechanical engineering, as well as flight science and aviation management and physics. We hope that you'll hear or see something today that piques your interest. Before we start, I wanted to give you an idea of how this webinar will flow. In just a moment, I'll introduce Dr. Zusiak, who will begin a tour of the soft tissue engineering lab. Along the way, we'll be introduced to current students, Joey and Ether. And after the lab tour, we'll take the final few minutes of the webinar for question and answer time. So throughout this webinar, we do encourage you to submit any questions you may have to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen if you're viewing through Zoom or in the comment section if you're viewing through Facebook Live. And we'll do our best to answer as many of those questions during the last few minutes. Throughout this webinar, you don't need to worry about turning off your microphone or camera. You can hear and see our presenters throughout the webinar, but we cannot hear or see you. This session will be recorded and posted to our YouTube page early next week, and you'll receive an email with that link when it becomes available. If you'd like to view any of our previous webinars, you'll also find those recordings in either a fall 2020 playlist or the spring 2021 playlist on our YouTube page. So now with all of that information out of the way, I am very happy to introduce SLU's biomedical engineering program and the soft tissue engineering lab. And Dr. Zustiak, I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Amy. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and again, I'm Dr. Sylvia Zustiak, and I'm an associate professor in biomedical engineering at St. Louis University. And this is our lab. Um, but first of all, I would like to tell you a little bit what our research is on. My lab focuses on hydrogel biomaterial for biomedical applications. And first of all, uh, if you don't know what a hydrogel means, it's simply a gel that's fully hydrated. Hence the name hydro. Um, hydrogels can contain up to 99% water. And actually, I'm sure that you have seen hydrogels in your life and you might have eaten one. And so, for example, jello, like jello, is considered a hydrogel because it's a hydrated gel. In fact, gelatin, which is the main ingredient of jello, besides the sugar and the color, so, uh, so to speak, um, it's actually also used in biomedical engineering as cell scaffold because it comes from collagen. And as you might or might not know, collagen is a protein which is found in all of our body and most abundant in the skin. So this is what we do. We take proteins that are either made by humans or that are made by nature. We extract those, we purify those, we maybe uh, make some changes to them, and then we make them into scaffolds to use for biomedical applications. So what are those applications? We, in our lab, focus on two major umbrellas of projects. One of them is focused on drug delivery. So we use those hydrogels as sustained release delivery devices, which means that you can take any biological molecule, which might have a therapeutic effect, put it inside those materials. We also make them injectable. And then you put this whole device, which is the hydrogel, all of that protein that you want to deliver, you can inject this in a specific area in the body and to let the protein drug release over time, having a sustained therapeutic effect instead of having, for example, daily doses. You can have a simple injection and the delivery can last for days to months to even years. This is, for example, how some contraceptives work and also some other devices already on the market. The other umbrella from our lab um, focuses on drug screening platforms. So what that really means is that we use our hydrogel 
to make models of tissues that we already have in the body. We focus on cancers. So we make mini cancers in the lab. We take the cancer cells, we make them form steroids or tumors, the same way they make them in the body. And then we put those tumors inside our hydrogel material. We make the material such that they emulate important parts of the tumor microenvironment. And this whole thing now becomes a mini living tumor tissue that we can use to test different therapies and see how they would work. All right, without further ado, I would like to show you what kind of equipment we have in the lab. To do this cell culture work, we need to have tissue culture tools. And those are the two behind me. As you can see, um, those are kind of isolated, insulated environments where we keep our cells when we work with them. We need to do this because we want to prevent contamination. So this particular, you can see this is glass right here, but also we can lift the glass and there is laminar flow, which basically protects the air coming from outside the foot into going inside the foot to contaminate the cell. As you know, bacteria is all around us. You breathe it, you eat it, right? But the cells cannot survive in the presence of bacteria. So we need to really, really, we need them um, in this tissue culture hood when we work with them. Also, as you know, the cells in our body need to be at 37 degrees Celsius and the pH of 7.4, right? So for the cells to be able to be in this environment, we use something which we call incubator. This is, this is the cell incubator. So as you can see right here, we have many, many experiments going on with many cells, which I'm gonna show in a little, in a few minutes. But this is where the cells are kept, this is their home. When we take them out of the incubator to image them, we have to put them back inside very quickly because they don't like to be cold, just like you don't like to be cold. All right, so let's move on a little bit. Now I'm gonna take you to the place where we characterize our material. As I mentioned, we make hydrogels, but once we make them, we need to characterize them for their specific properties. So one property which we characterize is the mechanical property. As you know, the tissues in your body have different stiffness, right? So the brain, for example, is very soft. It's actually one of the softest tissues in your body, but something like bone is gonna be much stiffer. When you make our materials, we want to see how stiff they are so that they can match the stiffness of the native tissue in the body. To do so, we use this instrument, which is called a rheometer. So what that does, we put our hydrogel at the bottom, and then we have a second plate on top of the first, on top of the hydrogel, and we simply oscillate the second plate. So we, we oscillate it. And so when we do this, we can deform the hydrogel. This machine measures how much deformation there is, and based on that, it can tell us how stiff that material was, right? So the softer it is, the more the deformation is going to be, the stiffer it is, the less deformation there is going to be. Another instrument in our lab is this right here. So this is called a high content imager. Sometimes we have to image the cells very quickly, especially when we do drug screening experiments. So here we can put the cells and you know how, how long it takes to take a picture, right? Like it takes a few seconds, even when you use your cell phone, and it's actually pretty quick. But what this machine does, we can put our plate of cells and it can take 100 pictures in about two minutes. And that really takes time. <laughs> it's actually very good, right? The students don't have to take their time to take those pictures. And we don't have to keep the cells outside of the incubator for too long. We have more incubators here behind me. Uh, we have an oven. So sometimes we need to cure our gels at different temperatures. Here, I will show you very quickly. So this is called a balance. Uh, so every time we measure our hydrogels, we need to make sure, you know, the, the exact amount. So this balance actually is very, very precise. You might have to use the balance at home, maybe in the kitchen, uh, but this will be uh, precise to the 0 0.000 milligrams, right? Um, which is like what, what we need for our studies. And here now I have my student. So this is Ether. And Ether is an other student in the lab. Um, and maybe she can tell us what she's working on today. And she can show us a little bit. So she's making hydrogel. So she's by printing a lot. So maybe she can show us uh, what she's doing today. So today I'd like 
we're going to be addressing with the protein release study. So right here we have some prepared hydrogels and they've been degrading for a while and I'm just going to be pipetting out some of the solution to see how much protein has been released by the hydrogels. All right, so from each of the wells in each of the wells on this plate, I'm just going to be pipetting out some of the solution. So this is how it goes. Like, so she would have to do this for all of her studies. Like she's. She has several hydrogels she's working on, and she has to repeat this several times. And and Ether, um, which which year are you in? And like maybe tell us just a little bit about about yourself. So I'm Ether, and I'm a freshman at SLU studying biomedical engineering. And I joined Dr. Zustiak's lab in November of last year. And I'm helping out a graduate student who is investigating how nanoparticles affect the degradation and other properties of hydrogels. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, so I will take you now uh, to our dark room. Uh, this is where we have our fluorescent microscope. So again, it's gonna get, get a little bit dark uh, because the room has all black walls and black ceiling. And this is so that when we take fluorescent images of our cells, there is no ambient light uh, not to interfere with the imaging. So it's a little dark. But that's going to actually allow you to see our stuff a little bit glowy. So, and then, yeah, so here's some of our cells uh, that we've uh, put into our hydrogels. And all of these three markers are cells. And then we also stain it with uh, another dye that only has those dead cells. So here we can see that there are a couple of dead cells. You can't really see that. But so there are a couple. We can see some uh, some more dots, and we can use that to quantify to see how many cells are alive versus dead. Which we can use to um, for drug screening assays to see what our cell viability is like. So this is our microscope. So maybe Joey, you can turn it to a different filter so that you can see. There you go. So Joey, maybe tell us very briefly um, about like which year into the program and uh, just your career in general here. So I am a PhD student uh, here working for Dr. Zuziak and this is my third year in the program. And so I'm working on projects to create models for glioblastoma so that we can test possible drug candidates uh, outside the body so we don't have to go through the expensive and costly uh, methods of doing testing on animals or humans, or to make when we do those tests on animals and humans so that we get more accurate results. So I will slowly back out of the dark room and back into the light. And there is just one more thing I will show you, um, and then maybe I will open the floor for questions. Um, so not to make you dizzy, I'll try to walk a little bit slow. Uh, you can see kind of behind me, it I keep with some different experiments and different samples. And um, now, now there's one more piece of equipment I would like to show you. Uh, so this is our UV oven. Um, this is where we also make some of our hydrogels. So some of our hydrogels to form this kind of three-dimensional structure, which looks like jello. Now we need to cross-link them in some way. So we start from a solution, but you have to do this to, some, to this solution. To have, you have to do something to make it solid, right? In some cases, uh, like jello, it could be temperature, but in our case, we actually use uh, ultraviolet light at 365 nanometers. So a very low energy ultraviolet light. We shine on our gel for a few seconds once we put them in this oven, and then they form kind of this uh, this three-dimensional structure. So I think um, at this point, this will be the lab tour. And um, I think we can take questions.
uh, many many small of equipment which we can show, but they're not as, and it's not as interesting, right? I mean, everything else that you need in the lab is the, um, the shakers, the pipe patterns, the sonicators, and, and, and so forth. We are ready for questions. All right. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Zustiak and Ether and Joey. Great to meet you all. Um, as Dr. Zustiak said, if you have any questions, please feel free to throw those in the Q&A feature if you're watching through Zoom uh, or in the comment section if you are on Facebook. I'll be monitoring both of those spaces. Um, but Dr. Zustiak, I have a question for you, and it's, it's one that, um, you know, we get quite a bit of, you know, when you think of the medical community, I think a lot of people think of doctors, nurses, uh, you know, people in hospitals that they see um, or in their doctor's office. But your work in, in biomedical research, um, what, what's your interaction with the medical field? How often are you working with, um, you know, medical practitioners? That's a very good question. Um, well, uh, I have to just step back a second and say that my, my first career choice was to be a, a medical doctor. <laughs> It so happened that I became an engineer and I became a biomedical engineer so that I can have this connection with the medical doctors yet not be one myself, <laughs> right? Um, and the, the, the other answer to your question is it depends on the project, but ultimately um, every project will be inspired by an actual medical need that a patient might have. And if we are lucky, in most cases, once we have um, gotten the feasibility study, <laughs> then we uh, collaborate with, uh, with clinicians or with medical school professors who can give us additional information, additional guidance on how to further develop our, our product. So for most of our projects, we do have a clinician on board. You know, they don't do um, as much of the work, obviously, because of the engineering part. But, you know, even, even though we want to design something, the goal for us is to talk to the medical professionals and the people before we design it, just because we, we would know that it will be used and it will be useful, right? Like, because I might have an excellent idea what might help a doctor do his job or her job, but they might not have the same idea. So it's important for the two ideas to merge like early in the discovery process so that we can develop a device that in the end will be useful to all. Excellent. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of collaboration and, um, you know, back and forth and, and pretty exciting. Um, it's a very collaborative field. That's absolutely true. <laughs> yes, I think that was one of kind of the um, uh, maybe common misconceptions of, of all engineering positions and all engineering careers is that it's very collaborative work. Team, teamwork is essential. Um, we had yes. an excellent question come in. I'm wondering what the job outlook for biomedical and tissue engineering is. Um, and then a secondary question of how do you go about pursuing um, a career in those fields? All right. Uh, well, pursuing a career in those fields, like the, my, my short answer is going to be uh, try to get a degree in the field, right? Uh, so bachelor's, master's, PhD, we have all of this level of students. And again, what kind of um, degree you get will depend on how far you'd like to go in your career and exactly what type of career you're pursuing. But um, what kind of careers? You, you know, you could go into medical devices. I think that the most obvious one would be medical devices and imaging. All of those devices that doctors use to treat or diagnose patients, those were designed by engineers. And those were designed by biomedical engineers in collaboration, perhaps with mechanical and electrical engineers. You know, we now have fields of bioelectrical or biomechanical and so forth, right? So all of those devices and tools are designed by engineers. So that's actually one career route. The other career route might be biopharmaceuticals. It is now, uh, you know, biopharmaceuticals, I, I think especially now in the, in the age of COVID, uh, ho hopefully have gotten some press, right? I mean, now we understand how important vaccines are and how important drugs are for treatment of patients. So again, those, uh, those companies will, those companies actually hire engineers, not just biologists, but also biomedical engineers. And of course, there are many startup companies Tissue engineering in particular is relatively new. It only was invented, so to speak, about 20 years ago. But now there are many, many promising startup companies, and now there's also larger companies which are employing biomedical engineers. And so those are going to be designing drug screening platforms. Those actually might be designing 
um, you know, tissue engineered body parts. We now have, for example, tissue engineered nerve graft, tissue engineered skin, tissue engineered uh, small, small organs and so forth. So there, there's a lot of actually exciting opportunities, not just to join large and established companies, but also to join smaller up and coming startup companies and be a true innovator. In fact, I just want to mention that, that many of our students have gone on to start their own companies. We have many entrepreneurs coming from our program that now are CEOs of their own companies. We do, yes, at our um, Engineering Summer Academy, we get to meet a few of our alumni who um, work now down in the Cortex area, which is uh, uh, just an area of startups and small businesses, including those in the biomedical field. Um, I'm wondering if now, would it be possible to pull Joey and Ether in? And could we hear from each of them their career goals and their interests in the field? Yeah, maybe we can have Joey first. So, for me, uh, well, how like my interest in the field, like how I got in, is I was also uh, wanted to go into medical school, and then I got into. Uh, Kind of doing some cancer research like what we're doing now and i just really liked actually doing the experiments and being more on this side of the side but on the clinical side so that's how i decided to stay or go in and pursue i guess uh higher education working on my phd uh and then for like job prospect uh kind of i've done a couple different things i had an internship working with medical devices in the hospital uh, just helping people, uh, helping fix medical devices. And then right now I'm kind of leaning more towards wanting to go into the pharmaceutical realm to help with uh, drug development and working on the tissue culture side of the drug development. Okay. Cool. So I was also initially purely pre-med, but um, I had a research experience in high school and I really fell in love with research. And that's when I discovered that MD-PhD was an option. So I'm hoping to become a physician scientist in the future. Those both sound so fascinating. Um, thank you both for sharing. I Maybe anybody can answer this question, but I know a lot of our biomedical engineering undergrads at Parks are looking at medical school. Um, how uh, so there are different paths to get to medical school, but but what would you say having that background in the engineering field rather than getting a you know a biology or a chemistry or a health science degree um, is th is there an advantage to coming from an engineering program into med school? Well, um, I might be a little bit biased, but I would say yes. <laughs> right, I'm an engineer. Um, engineering just by a little bit by default, it's a little bit harder. So we might have students uh, who come as pre-med into our program who decide to switch to biology just because they realize that they might not be able to keep a 4.00 GPA, but they might end up with a 3.94 GPA, right? Uh, so it's not really a big, a big deal. What we're trying to advise the students is that it is, it is universally understood that engineering is just hard. And so proving yourself in an engineering field will still get you into medical school, even if you don't have the 4.00 GPA, but you're gonna have all of the experiences of being an engineer. It's also, you know, engineers, we are creative, right? We are creative and we are problem solvers. It's not like, I think there's a stereotype that, you know, we are just these nerdy people that, you know, like work by ourselves and it's like, there's nothing exciting about it, which is not the case. You know, we invent things, we do exciting new things, right? We are innovators, we are entrepreneurs. So I, I think we also train students to be problem solvers. I would love to have a doctor <laughs> treating me if I have a disease, like who is a problem solver, right? So, so, so to me, that's an excellent quality that, that every doctor would benefit from. But then the other thing is, you know, again, coming from an engineering degree, <laughs> as the two students who just talked to you have told you, if you decide to switch fields, right? If you in the end you decide that maybe you don't want to be a doctor after all, you have an excellent career path in front of you. It's not just a plan B, right? It is a plan B, but it's actually an excellent plan B. So uh, I, I'd encourage all of you, if you like engineering, why not? Even if you're a pre-med, engineering is a good pathway 
and a good trampoline to get you into medical school. And we have many students who do so. We actually have one third of our students end up in med school and they end up in top med schools around the country, including our own at State Lawrence University. <laughs> Yes, a nice plug there as well for that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, just just hearing about it, and um, and I'm lucky enough that I get to work with a lot of our biomedical engineering students and faculty. And yes, I can attest, it is exciting, and there's a lot of um, important work that's being done. Um, so you know, students who are interested, maybe in uh, you know directly helping people, um, but also with that engineering bent of of creating something new. Um, it's it's the perfect field to blend those. Um, we have time for one more question, and I see one just came in. Um, so if you go into biomedical engineering, um, I'm going to reword this question that came in, if that's okay. Uh, and I think we we kind of answered it, but you can go into biomedical engineering and get an undergraduate degree, and then throughout your undergraduate degree, you can choose, um, you know, if if you would like to go to medical school after your undergraduate degree, because it is a postgraduate degree, you can. Um, but you can also, you know, maybe for students who change their mind, they can then find a career in another aspect of biomedical engineering that isn't a medical school. Um, so John, I hope, I hope that answered your question. Um, and then I was wondering if we could pull Ether and Joey back really quick. And would you guys each have a, a piece of advice to share to a high school student that might be considering engineering right now and, and maybe specifically biomedical engineering? Um, so one piece of advice I would say is that specifically within engineering, there's a lot of opportunities, especially from your freshman year. And I would say being proactive about like discovering your interests, reaching out to faculty about like research positions, or even just like being involved in extracurriculars. We have a ton of biomedical engineering clubs. And I think uh, those opportunities can really help you expand what you learn in the classroom. So I would say actively seek those opportunities out when you get to college. Yeah, I would just say, I think engineering is a really nice and a good opportunity for everyone. Like you're gonna learn a lot. It's very interdisciplinary. And I would say, especially with biomedical engineering, since you grab for from everything, you can do almost anything with the biomedical engineering degree. I know people that are in business right now and sales. I know people in med school. I know people doing and working at startups. Like. You can do anything with the biomedical engineering degree. It really opens up a lot of opportunities for you. Great, thank you. All right, well, this this is bringing us to the end of our webinar today, everyone. But a huge thank you to Dr. Zustiak and Joey and Ether for sharing your time with us showing us around the soft tissue engineering lab. And then also a thank you to our viewers today. Thanks for tuning in. And we hope that you enjoyed uh, this visit. If you would like to learn more about the engineering programs at St. Louis University, please visit us at slu.edu slash parks. And as always, you can reach out to us at our email address, parksevents, both plural, at slu.edu if you'd like to connect further with our programs. For any teachers who are logged in today, we'd be happy to set up a virtual lab visit or guest speaker for your classroom this semester. Please just send us an email to get that scheduled. And we hope that everyone will join us again in this space next week for a visit to the electrical engineering program on Wednesday, March 17th at 4 p.m. All right, so this concludes our webinar today. Thank you once again for joining us. Have a great weekend ahead.